And so I thought at the time... Uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi from earlier today will leave this now and return to live coverage from the Rayburn House Office Building on Capitol Hill. The uh, House Oversight and Government Reform Committee's hearing on the financial collapse of AIG. Committee members have been hearing from the former chair of AIG, Maurice Greenberg. This is live coverage on C-SPAN 3. So um, on that note, I yield time to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Greenberg, welcome and thank you for being present for this questioning. I want to take you back to uh, the time that there uh, was a discussion about the first bailout. And uh, back to Mr. Secretary Paulson. Now, when Secretary Paulson was involved with the AIG bailout, um, it's my understanding that there was a meeting that took place at the New York um, Federal Reserve over the bailout loan and that there was only one firm that had a representative at that meeting and it was Goldman Sachs. Do you know anything about that at all? Are you Can you move on? that mic a little bit closer, sir? On? Or turn it on? Is that better? Yeah. yeah I, I, would you discuss uh, bless you. Could, would you discuss the relationship between uh, Mr. Paulson and AIG and the, and the loan and Goldman Sachs? Well, I'll tell you what I know about it. Um, um, I learned of the um, of the meeting to be taken uh, that be held at the New York Fed. Uh, I, I did not know who would be attending, but I called. Uh, who uh, Tim Geithner, who was then president of the New York Fed. You called Tim Geithner? Yes, he was then president of the New York Fed. Right. Um, uh, I knew him. At one point, I chaired the New York Fed. Uh, and um, So you were in regular discussions with Mr. Geithner about what was going on? No, not regular discussions. Uh, but you talked to him about it? Yeah, and um, I said I thought that we deserved a seat at the table. There was going to be a meeting uh, since we were the largest shareholder. And um, he said, I hear you, but uh, uh, we were never invited to the meeting. So I don't know who was present. Did you have anybody uh, from your firm present at all? No. Even though they were discussing bailing out AIG? No, sir. Tell this committee about uh, your discussions with the New York Fed when you understood that you were having difficulties? Well, not when, uh, remember, I was out of the company when all of this about happened. About the discussions that, a that you knew AIG may or may not have been having. Do you know anything about those discussions? I knew that AIG was having troubles. You read about it in the press and, you, and their 10K and their earnings report. So we knew but you don't know happened. anything about any discussions with the New York Fed at the time? No, I didn't know about any discussions until the day that, in fact, the meeting was being held. And that's when I called. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. I, I want to move on to talking about the credit rating agencies. On August 2nd, 2008, Standard & Poor's Rating Service concluded, despite apparent losses by AIG and its subsidiaries of $5.4 billion, the company rating should not be changed. And I find it troubling that S&P essentially decided not to change AIG's ratings despite clear signs the company had a liquidity problem. How much responsibility, Mr. Greenberg, do you think should be placed on ratings agencies for failing to provide consumers with a proper and well-researched re well uh, rating? Look, I think the rating agencies um, uh, should be regulated. Uh, I think that uh, the rating agencies, um, at one point, as you know, uh, called some of the uh, real estate assets, AAA, these new securities, then later on withdrew the ratings. Um, in a way, it was, I thought, uh, uh, not as responsible as it should be. I do think they should be regulated. Well, uh, did you, by the way, did you have a chance to, uh, to read <coughs> the uh, Time Magazine piece? on uh, AIG, how it became too big to, uh, to fail? I have it in my reading. I haven't gotten to it yet. Okay. 
Uh, I, want, I want to go to um, the question about the counterparties, particularly uh, society. About the which? Uh, the counterparties. Yeah. Uh, AIGFP counterparties, the Societe Generale. Many of AIG's counterparties were very sophisticated financial service firms in their own right. At some point, long before the implosion in late 2008, many of them began to understand that AIG was in a vulnerable position. For example, Societe Generale issued a June 2008 sell recommendation to holders of AIG shares. Now, logic dictates that if these firms understood the overall weakness of AIG, then they should have known that the company may ultimately not be able to pay out under the terms of the credit default swaps. Yet, Societe Generale did little to hedge their investments or further insure their capital in response to this information. Uh, to what degree was the counterparty's failure to act part of the problem and how much blame rests on their shoulders? Well, I, I think they should have acted, but I think also uh, it goes back to what I was talking about earlier today about how to try and help the taxpayer uh, with respect to the problems that exist at AIG. If there were guarantees issued rather than cash, uh, it seems to me that would have made a huge difference not only to AIG uh, but to the taxpayer. Um, that was done, as you know, uh, for Citigroup, and there's, I see no reason that I can think of that guarantees were not used. Um, if the if the um, if the Fed said we're going to stand behind AIG financial products, it would have essentially put a, a AAA stamp on FP during that period of time, and the counterparties would have had no, I don't think, any uh, any recourse but to take a guarantee. That would have made a major difference, not only to AIG, but to the taxpayer, they would not have had to uh, put out as much money as they have done so. Uh, I, I just one final question from a policy standpoint. Uh, you've testified generally that you're in favor of transparency. Yes, sir. Uh, have you spoken to this, uh, to the fact that the Fed right now is uh, literally printing trillions of dollars creating trillions of dollars out of thin air and giving it to um, God knows who and what, however amounts. Can you tell us, do you see anything, anything problematic uh, with that kind of an approach to flood money into the market and not really have an understanding of where it might be going or how much? Well, sure, I have a, I have a concern about that. That uh, Obviously, at some point, uh, you know, there's, there's a payday uh, by the, by the, in the U.S. economy. Uh, if you flood the economy with uh, uh, with trillions of dollars of more of uh, of more uh, cash, uh, sometime you got you have to pay for that, and uh, and so obviously uh, I'd like to see a little more uh, transparency on where it's going and for what purpose. Thank you, sir. The gentleman recognizes Mr. Drehaus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Greenberg, for your testimony. Uh, I'd like to pursue uh, a conversation about systemic risk regulation. We've been talking a lot in the Financial Ser Services Committee about systemic risk. And you mentioned in your testimony, and I'm just paraphrasing you, uh, that the role of government is to get businesses back on track that have fallen aside. I, I would argue that the role of government is to protect the public good. And, and I think uh, what we are talking about when we talk about systemic risk is at what point does a product or does an entity, uh, because of its potential fa failure, become such a risk that its failure would do considerably damage to the public good? I would like your assessment of that as it applies to AIGFP. And you mentioned that it wasn't a structural problem within AIG, but it was a management problem. Well, regardless if it's a management problem or a, product, a problem of the product itself, the result of its failure has had tremendous consequences to the public good. So in your opinion, what is it we should be focusing on in terms of systemic risk? And where was that systemic risk as it applies to AIG? 
There are two things that I would say about that. Uh, one, I think credit default swaps uh, probably should be regulated. Uh, there could be, there have been indexes um, and exchange should be created so that it is uh, transparent. I think that a credit default swap um, is in a sense an insurance policy uh, that's guaranteeing an underlying in a, in a counterparty's uh, investment either in a bond or other security. Uh, and I think reserves ought to be established, therefore, by those who issue credit default swaps. Um, I believe that was considered by the Congress some time ago uh, and, um, and rejected. I believe it should, in fact, be in place. Um, there's, on, on a separate issue, you know, there has been long been um, a debate whether insurance per se uh, should be federal, federal regulated or state regulated. Uh, I've long personally advocated that to be an option that there are companies who operate in all states and issue many different types of products uh, that would be better served if they had a federal charter rather than a state charter. Although a state charter is necessary for many companies, I think the option uh, would serve us better. But, but is, is the issue the, the regulation of the company itself or the products that that company is selling? So that, you know, you could have a, a good regulator, but if they are not regulating a line of business that is putting the public at risk and putting the company at risk, then that really doesn't matter. And so it's not so much the regulatory authority as it is the product itself. I'm, I'm curious, when you say credit default swap should be regulated, who, who do you think should be doing that regulation? Well, first of all, let me say that uh, AIG itself had a federal regulator, had the Office of Thrift mm -hmm. uh, Supervision, was a federal regulator of AIG. In addition to the state regulatory uh, bodies for each of the insurance subsidiaries. So there was, there was regulation. Now, was the regulation adequate? Uh, should it have been broadened? I think that must be reviewed to determine whether or not it's adequate. And obviously, in many ways, it's not. And so it should be. Uh, and so, you know, I have no problem uh, suggesting that there be uh, more regulation. But we've got to be thoughtful how we do it so we don't regulate ourselves into a position of being so overregulated that nothing happens. You want to have a, a proper balance. So, so in your opinion, what is that balance? Where, you know, at, at what point is, is it necessary to, to regulate a product? that an insurance company is selling? I think, I think if the Office of Thrift Administration um, had said, hey, you're, you're, over, uh, you're overreaching by writing as much credit default swaps as you are and have been doing, it should have been, it should have been uh, brought to the attention of management. And, uh, and if management didn't do anything about it, then they should, they should have had the authority uh, to say stop. So, so do you think then that we should allow the flexibility to the industry to create the products that the product that they deem necessary uh, for business, or should we disallow certain products? When you talk about regulation, is it a matter of transparency and uh, identifying the appropriate risk associated with those products, or is it the products in and of themselves? I think you've got to be careful uh, that you don't uh, stymie innovation. I think product innovation has been one of the great things that this country has been good at. Um, but you have to have the, the other side, the balance of it, to make certain uh, that from the regulatory point of view that, that they have looked at and agree with what the risk factors are and whether or not there are sufficient reserves uh, that are being established for a product that needs reserves. And that if it's going to outgrow the capital of the company, uh, they ought to know that and be able to sense that and do something about it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Greenberg, you know that in the Financial Services Committee we're uh, working on both insurance regulation and, of course, overall uh, reform of regulatory activity in the United States. Now, 
it, it seems to me what you have described to us when you ran the company, you allowed a subsidiary that was unregulated in London to collateralize the credit rating uh, agencies' positions of the main company here in the United States and, and didn't really put much equity or capital into the London FP. Is that correct? No, I don't quite underst didn't understand your, your, your question. We had a, they had a, um, a unit in London, mm -hmm. but it was managed. We had oversight of it. We had but, risk. But, but it had no regulator either in the it UK had no what? or in the United States. It had no regulator. It was without well, regulation. No, 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 that's not true. The uh, Office of Thrift Administration. Uh, that, that, that was a bank that was owned in your line. It wasn't that organization. But, but my understanding, though, uh, is that the Office of Thrift, Thrift Regulation did go to London and, uh, and, and oversee that, uh, that unit. You mean uh, uh, because they had a billion dollar thrift organization, they, they sent this regulator all around the world to regulate and look over and audit multi hundreds of billions of dollars of assets? I believe that they, they, uh, they did look at AIG FP in its entirety. Okay. It, I guess it would, if, if the regulator went over there, it would have made a great trip for a regulator to go over. But certainly there wasn't a full time uh, a seat in AIG FP in London. We didn't have a representative there watching something that was carrying on $2.7 trillion. That's notional value. Yeah. That's, that's what you can lose. Well, yeah, but that, that's notional value. That, 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 that's nothing like the real value. It's notional. Well, haven't we lost or had to pay out to counterparties somewhere close to $80 billion already out of Treasury? Well, we've talked about that, and I think that, you know, I, I think that that's not the fault of, I would say, of, of AIG. I think that was part well, of the uh, well, that I, was part of the bailout, which I think should have been done differently. Well, that's we, why I'm here. If we hadn't had failure of that organization, if we hadn't had failure of AIG, we wouldn't have a bailout, and we wouldn't be here today. I, I that's agree conceded. With you. Yeah. And probably there wouldn't have been failure of any of those organizations if the market hadn't turned significantly. Those are all contingencies, but the fact is nobody was overviewing that. I want to get more to the essence of what we should do in the future. Do you really think it's reasonable to allow an insurance company in the United States that has normal insurance that it's writing to set up this organization in London that escapes real regulation, real regulation, and let them deal in the trillions of dollars of speculation? And to some people's comment, that they were out of their leg, that they just weren't able to do the job, that it was really high risk? I think you're, uh, there are several questions that you have in there that I think need to be answered. First of all, uh, the insurance subsidiaries of AIG were fully protected well, under state. Uh, you know, may I finish? But let's stop there. That's one nice thing to say, they're fully protected. But if they're fully protected and you weren't utilizing their collateral or assets, then that, that FP was completely without funds to pay off counterparties. No. Where, where, were, where were they going to meet the call that would occur if there was a failure? AIG parent had capital of its own through retained earnings that had been. I, I think you talked about $5 billion or something? No, 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 no. AIG, AIG parent, my recollection, okay. had about $70 billion okay. of retained earnings. Okay. Uh, so AIG parent. Well, well, I don't want to go into all the structure and everything because I, I'm really not interested. Now I'm interested in what's the principle that we have to pass to f find out how we should regulate or how we will regulate in the future. Do you believe we should allow other huge insurance companies such as your former company to engage in this activity without further collateral, without further equity, and without certainly more stringent uh, uh, regulation? No, no. I'm, I've just finished saying that I think that there has to be some change. Okay. AIG, for example, owned uh, 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 International Lease Finance, yeah. which turned out to be the largest airline leasing company in the world. I mean, would, we, would you say you shouldn't do that also? I, I think that it's not a question if of If they what shouldn't do that, Mr. Greenberg, if they're using the credit rating of their insurance company back in the United States as the collateralization for that business activity, I would say they shouldn't do it. Yeah. That's not their business. If they want to go into the leasing business, form 
a corporation that leases planes totally collateralize it with equity and go into the business? Well, why should you have a right to pyramid an insurance company that, that, that is operating that way in an unregulated but entity? You, but they weren't uh, uh, doing that. In other words, AIG parent used its own capital, not that of the subsidiary insurance companies. You can't touch those. The insurance company subsidiaries were fully protected. Maybe. Now, I'm not suggesting to you that there shouldn't be more regulation uh, or even more capital in relationship to certain types of businesses. I, I've already said that. I believe that. But our, 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 the point I'm trying to make with you is that at where do we end this potential of the use of insurance uh, entities to collateralize other business operations, but particularly more risky business operations that obviously weren't too successful in a downturned economy. I mean, literally, you can say that they had capital, but that would have fast disappeared and in fact did. And if Treasury hadn't come in with the taxpayers' funds, uh, we would have had a bank bankrupt situation. A and, and you can say, well, that happened after your watch. But here's the question I have. Aren't you a substantial stockholder even today of AIG? Yes, I am. Well, after you left uh, control of the company in uh, 05, and you knew that they had this unregulated entity in Europe, did you pay attention to how they were dealing in the swaps in Europe? You know, I wasn't getting any information. Well, that's, that's, I, I assumed you weren't. Then, as the largest stockholder, hadn't you ever looked at the potential of a shareholder's uh, a lawsuit to determine I, what was happening to protect your own interest? Yeah, well, there is a lawsuit pending. And, and you started it back then when you no, you no longer had the information, or have you started a lawsuit now after the fact to protect your interest so the assets aren't wiped out of AIG? Well, if, if you recall, uh, AIG had an investors' meeting, and at that investors' meeting, tried to assure assured everybody. I, 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 again, I'm not, not getting into this because of you or AIG. It, what I say the principle is that we cannot rely that even large shareholders such as yourself will take on the normal action of watching how the corporation they're so heavily invested in, what they're doing. Well, you can't. I mean, you just don't get the same information. So do you think in our re-regulation we should create additional powers for shareholders to inquire and force disclosure of companies like this so they can no longer in the future operate I, under cloak? I have no problem with, with, with more disclosure. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, ask for unanimous consent at this time yeah. to have inserted in the record. In fact, I've asked for more disclosure. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, ask unanimous consent to insert in the record at this point, because of your questioning, the United States Security and Exchange Commission litigation release of February 9, 2006, which uh, is right on point to your question, which talks about 2000 to 2001 AIG entering into a $1.6 billion settlement related to off-book or sham reinsurance transactions. Without objection. Thank so you, Mr. Chairman. Who's the next? Mr. Lynch. Okay. The Chair recognizes Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thought I was going to have to wait in line. Uh, Mr. Greenberg, thank you for coming and testifying before the, the subcommittee, the committee. Uh, our job in some cases is uh, and in this case is really a forensic investigation. We're looking back, uh, it's part forensic and part accident reconstruction. Uh, and, and some would say part triage as we try to figure out who we can save and, and who has to be let go. Uh, in your testimony, you, you indicate that you felt that uh, when you were there in, in the, uh, the seat at AIG that you had good risk management uh, uh, practices in place. But in looking back at this, you certainly uh, were, were in charge when AIG went from uh, a, a basic uh, insurance company toward this uh, movement into uh, complex derivatives and, and credit default swaps. You were there at that time when you made that decision. Uh, and. And, and again, in looking at this and trying to figure out what happened, it appears that, number one, uh, a lot of this 
activity was not leveraged. I, I'm sorry, it was not hedged. It was not hedged properly. And secondly, in some cases, in, in a lot of cases, there were not sufficient reserves to justify the true insurance value of, of uh, some of these instruments. How, how, do you, how, do you, how do you reconcile those two statements? You say you had the proper uh, risk management policies in place, but you're not hedging and you're not, you're not providing proper reserves. I don't get that. Well, let's take it one at a time. The, um, the credit default swaps that we wrote uh, in the beginning with the regulatory uh, swaps for banks in Europe. And I know for a fact that they ran off uh, with no loss whatever. Uh, that's, that's the first, first wait, part. Wait a minute. Are you talking about, what are you talking about here? The, you, you're saying you haven't, is this the statement you referred to earlier about the, the head of OTS said? No. Oh, okay. No. no All right. No. Uh, let me explain that what, what the regulatory uh, capital for banks were. Um, Basel I um, said to the European banks, or the banks, but principally the European banks, you're going to be charged um, for capital needs even if the credit line is not taken down by your client. And so uh, AIG Financial Products designed a product, a credit default swap, that was more efficient from a pricing point of view uh, than what would have been the charge against the bank's capital uh, had they followed Basel I that way. Uh, and that was the first credit default swaps that we wrote. Uh, and my understanding is that ran off with no losses at all. Uh, uh, so that was there was nothing improper about that. Um, I've already but that, said that 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 apparently, based on the situation today, on all the transactions that have been done, that is an exceptional case, though, uh, in terms of what has happened since then. No, I don't know if it's an exceptional case because I'm I say I haven't been in the company, but um, for four years. Well, based on what we've had uh, purchased by Maiden Lane, uh, those credit default swaps. Uh, uh, are in the toilet, so to speak. And well, if, if, we had to, if we had to sell them today, we would have massive uh, realized losses, not just paper losses. You know, I'm glad you raised Maiden Lane 3 uh, because I think Maiden Lane 3 uh, was a terrible, a terrible uh, deal from the point of view of the taxpayer and AIG. We agree. Uh, that, was, uh, that was purchased uh, at, uh, at par. At par, even though the even though the marks on the on those uh, um, uh, uh, CDOs I understand. was well, way I, down, I, I have I limited never time, understand. but I do want to. I do want to. I anticipate your point. You're going to say we should have used guarantees instead of purchasing them outright. Is that your point? Well, that's one of the points. But why would you pay par? Right. No, no. I'm not. You're not taking yes for an answer. I agree with you. <laughs> I agree with you. Uh, okay. I, I just want to move to one other piece on this, and that is. The regulatory piece that you were just talking about uh, with, with uh, the gentleman earlier. It looks from my standpoint that, that AIG, in, in, a, in a sense, manipulated the regulatory system here by, by chartering uh, thrifts, multiple thrifts. You basically selected your, your regulator, uh, the Office of Thrift Supervision. And, uh, and, and so you basically selected your regulator by by your own conduct, and, and as well, you took advantage, I think, uh, not, not illegally, but, but you took advantage of uh, uh, the FDIC guarantee on deposits uh, in, in light of the bank holding company, that uh, the thrifts holding company that was created at AIG. Was that your strategy? No, no, Congressman, that wasn't the strategy. Uh, AIG was, first of all, you have to look at the to to total company. We had insurance uh, being regulated by the states uh, or by foreign governments wherever we operated. We had a thrift in the United States that, was, that we were growing because we were in the financial services business, uh, not just a thrift. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we owned ILFC, an airline leasing company. Uh, 
So we had to pick some regulator, and and uh, it, it appeared that uh, the regulator who would regulate the thrift would be the proper regulator for for the rest of of the financial services, which would include um, uh, AIG Financial Products at the time. Uh, AIG Financial Products was not a huge company in the beginning. It was a very right. very modest company. Right. I, I understand. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, appreci I appreciate your, your courtesy. I, my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lynch. Uh, gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster. And thank you for appearing today. Um, my, my questions are going to focus mainly on trying to get at the, the least intrusive set of rules that would have allowed you to build your business as a healthy insurance company and would have prevented perhaps you and certainly your, your successors to getting into the, the risk that they got into that left the taxpayer in some trouble here. Um, and first off, are, are you familiar with Alan Greenspan's recent suggestion that capital requirements be turned up as, uh, as businesses approach um, the size that they pose a systemic risk? Are you familiar with that suggestion? Do you have a reaction to I it? I think I've heard it. And uh, uh, I have no problem uh, with the need to increase capital uh, if there is the belief that a systemic risk uh, would, uh, would be uh, um, occurring. It depends on the interpretation of that uh, and to ensure that it's not going to go overboard in one direction. Uh, Okay. Um, I was also a little bit interested in your description of the enterprise-wide risk management that, that you felt you had in place, because that's a very different um, story, frankly, than I got from Mr. Liddy when I talked to him about this. Um, when I talked to the, the people at the, the large investment banks, or, or the corpses of them, um, they, they say that at least the ones that survived had very extensive um, risk management systems, you know, server farms. Um, dozens of programmers that, that netted out in real time their exposure to every risk or, or pairs of risk that you can imagine. And did you have anything like this in place at AIG? Well, let me explain what we had. I mentioned a little while ago that um, uh, I was chairman at the New York Fed for a number of years going back in time and um, was very impressed with, a, uh, uh, with an individual who uh, was responsible for market risk analysis of the banking structure. He retired and I hired him and brought him into AIG. So we had a market risk um, sector and we had a credit risk sector. We are putting them together, it was called enterprise risk. Uh, it had, they, they were staffed fairly extensively and they had operations worldwide. Um, it reported to the chief financial officer, um, and it was a very active and I believe very, very efficient organization. Any time uh, there would be an accumulation of risk in different areas of the company that exceeded prudence, it would, it would bubble up and there would be discussions about it. That enterprise risk department met on a, I think, a biweekly basis. Um, and at the senior staff meetings that I held weekly, uh, there'd be reports on, on, uh, on their activities. And if anything came up that was the least bit suspicious, we would do something about it. You've got to remember. You know, did these ever flag? Did these ever flag the activities of, of AIG financial oh, products yes. as being, I mean, there, as being it, a systemic risk to the company? Oh, yes. I mean, there were products that we said no to. Okay, and, and you'd uh, mentioned that after the ratings downgrade that, that the, your successors um, still expanded the, the CDS book um, for, uh, significantly. Um, and and they, what they didn't do was to hedge against these risks and shut down the, the increase in the, in the books. And so what I was wondering, if they had done that, which I agree was, would have been the, the responsible thing to do, what would that have done to the compensation of the executives at the top of AIG? Um, what, if they had, the, the cost of those hedgings presumably would have reduced profits, the fact that you're no longer booking the new business, um, these things, would that have had a positive or negative impact? It, on would, have reduced, it would have reduced their earnings. And, and, a, and a significant and they, effect? And they, well, I don't know about significant, but it would, would have reduced their earnings. Okay, so this was a clear example where the incentives for management were not aligned with the incentives that were in the best interest of the company. That's possible. Okay. 
Um, but you know, but, but let me, uh, Mr. Foster, let me go on with that. Then that happens very often in the insurance sector. You can have, in the insurance sector, you can be writing for argument's sake, directors and officers liability insurance. And, uh, and there comes a time when, uh, when uh, uh, rates are inadequate or losses are greater, and you say we're, we're just slowing down growth in that area, period. Right. Of course, certainly you can imagine general principles that says that the, your compensation, your bonuses, um, should be paid out only after the risks that you've entered into on your watch have cleared, which is yeah. certainly something that didn't happen in this case. Yeah, in any case, I, my time's up. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, much. the gentleman's time has expired. Yeah. I yield time to five minutes to Congresswoman Maloney from the great state of New York. Congresswoman Maloney. I thank the uh, chairman for yielding and for his leadership and, and welcome uh, Mr. Greenberg. Um, AIG, uh, formerly a great um, uh, American company, has taught us some very expensive lessons. We now know how dangerous an unregulated market for financial uh, derivatives, in the case of AIG, credit default swaps uh, can be. We now know that lax oversight of large financial institutions like AIG can threaten the very financial fabric of America. And we now know that uh, our regulators uh, need stronger tools uh, to put large financial institutions into receivership when their failure threatens the economy of our country. Uh, just last week, Secretary Geithner testified before Congress and put forward a plan that would allow the government to handle big firms that are failing. Chairman Bernanke testified that he believed a receivership would have been better for AIG than the present mess that we are in. And uh, he testified in support of this legislation. And I would like to ask you, do you believe if we had had that process in place, a receivership would have been better for AIG and the American taxpayer and the economy? Um, thank you for that question. Um, Given the terms, the, the original terms uh, that uh, the government gave AIG for $85 billion uh, of a loan, uh, which funneled money almost immediately out the back door to counterparties, charged 14 percent interest, and took 79.9 percent of the company, clearly everybody would have been better off, in my judgment, if they had declared Chapter 11. And, and uh, can, you, can you explain to us how would AIG be better now if they had been in a receivership or Chapter 11? Well, there probably would have been dip financing. Uh, the, um, there would have been a, a restructuring of the company. I presume that AIG FP would have been walled off. Uh, you would have, you would, all the counterparties would have been general creditors. Um, they would not have gotten anything like uh, the um, the collateral that they did get. Remember uh, that the CDOs that under that was underlying the credit default swaps uh, were not in default. Uh, it was the collateral that was required, and the fact that they may have had lower marks on the CDOs, but uh, they would have been general creditors. Well, well thank you for that uh, testimony. I, it's very important uh, coming from someone with the experience that you have. Uh, could you also comment on a very important uh, plan that is before Congress now, the Treasury's Toxic Structures and Toxic Securities uh, Plan, the so-called uh, uh, buying the toxic assets um, with government financing providing on very generous terms. Uh, so the threat may be, some say, that we'll end, end up uh, handing big gains to private investors at taxpayers' expense. Uh, what is your feeling of the toxic uh, uh, asset plan? Well, you know, what I have, uh, uh, what I do know about it, so far it, it hasn't seemed overwhelming uh, to the market. Um, it's only going to be successful, A, if there's an awful lot of buyers who are going to buy in. Um, and yes, it will provide the banks 
uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, getting rid of toxic assets, presumably at a better value. But so far, it hasn't really stirred up a great deal of buying interest. Uh, it may be early days, but there's no question that the banks will be the beneficiary. Some have said that the main challenge we're confronting in getting our economy moving forward is lack of liquidity, lack of credit, lack of movement. And uh, some have said maybe it would be better if our, if our dollars, our, our federal dollars, taxpayers' dollars, went into institutions that will l lend, uh, community banks, regional banks, uh, small business banks, whatever, and get that money out into the community and help the economy moving. What would be, what would happen if the dollars went in that direction and the toxic assets were just allowed to remain on the books? Look, why, why can't we just leave the toxic assets on the books? What, what would be the better approach? To put our dollars into buying up toxic assets or put our dollars into to pushing credit out into the communities across America? Well, I think we have to, uh, I think we have to solve both problems. I do think that credit, uh, the availability of credit is or the lack thereof is a major problem. And I think getting funds to the small regional banks and community banks uh, that would lend uh, would be very, very desirable. But I do think we need the large banks as well. I don't think it's an either or. I think it's important to do both. And, and we cannot leave the toxic assets on, in the bank's books. Why can we not le just leave them there? Well, it depends Until they it. mature to the value that they say they're really worth. I think it depends on what you do with mark to market. If the bill, if the bill that is now not a bill, but if if FASB, uh, who is considering mark to market as we sit here today, uh, modifies mark to market accounting, it will have an impact on the value of the so-called toxic assets, uh, and not have to carry them at these low marks. The same is true, incidentally for the life insurance industry. Mark to market has had uh, what you call fair value accounting has had a very, very dramatic effect on our financial system. The gentlewoman's time has expired. Thank you. I now yield five minutes to the gen gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman, I'd ask uh, without objection that my uh, prepared statement be entered into the record. So ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and Mr. Greenberg, thank you for joining us here today. Um, <coughs> if I understand you, your testimony correctly, um, one, of the, uh, one of the financial instruments you consider to be the, a, a main culprit in this great drama are credit default swaps. Is that correct? Well, yes, but I think that, uh, as I just mentioned a moment ago, um, I, I think the, um, the change in accounting rules uh, played played a role. Right, right. Um, and the rating agencies as well. And you know there was a number of things that came together. Uh, credit default swaps per se were not evil, um, but if you you write them when you have certain ratings, and if you lose those ratings, uh, you have to have a different business strategy. Sure. But credit default swaps originally start, start out sort of as almost an insurance mechanism and kind of then got traded and uh, speculated upon and grew astronomically, did they not? They did, uh, throughout, the, throughout the whole industry. Yeah. In 2000, the decision was made explicitly to preclude credit default swaps from federal regulation. Did you personally or did AIG have a position on that decision at that time as to the regulation of these instruments? No, no, sir. In retrospect, I gather also from your testimony, you would consider that to have been a mistake. I'm not even sure we knew about it at the time. Uh, I think that um, if we had known about it, I can't tell you what we would have done because at, in 2000, I think the amount of, of uh, credit default swaps that we were in, involved with was fairly modest in relationship to AIG. But it is an insurance product, and if it had been uh, debated, I think we would probably would have come down, I think, on, a, on a treating it like insurance. But if I gather from your answers to Ms. Maloney and others, you now think there should be some kind of regulatory regime 
to rein in these instruments. Absolutely. What's your guess of how the, the potential value one might put on the aggregate of these instruments? I've heard, I've heard as high as $45 trillion. Yeah, but that, that's notional value. Um, it's and, still uh, a lot of notional value. It's a lot of notional value, uh, yeah. Um, I, can't, I, I can't answer that. I don't know. One, one of the concerns one might have, let's pick a number, let's say it's half that just for the sake of argument, it would still, it could still sink a big battleship. I mean, yeah, but 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 seems to me you, you can't do one thing without the other. You're going to have reserves. You got to have an index. You got to have an exchange. They got to be traded, uh, so it'll seek its own level. Uh, you'll find out in a after working with it for a year or two uh, how much reserves are really adequate and necessary, and how much you're not. Well, let me pick up on that point. What kind of reserves are we talking about? I mean, if, if, you're, if you're company X, and for good or ill, however you got here, you've got, you're carrying several trillion dollars worth of CDS, what kind of reserve would, would we require of such a company? And what are the consequences of doing that, in a sense, in the middle of the game? Well, it would be very difficult. You'll have to have an actuarial study as to as to what the default rate really is, uh, and what's going to happen to mark to market as it applies to that. Um, because remember, the amount of actual losses in the credit default area has not been, as of now, has not been huge. It's the marks that have been, have, have been a problem. If that's modified, uh, it'll change the outlook very considerably. So you must consider all aspects. You can't just look at, in my judgment, just look at, yes, we need reserves, but in reserves in relationship to what? I thank the gentleman. My time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, now yield time to uh, Congressman Welch. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to follow up on some of the uh, uh, questions of my colleagues. Uh, you know, it's an astonishing thing. You've heard this, that uh, this incredible company, Lehman Brothers was here earlier, goes back to the Civil War. Uh, Bear Stearns, AIG, I guess you started in the 1890s. Hundreds of thousands of people who work there, millions of shareholders. It's all blown up. Uh, absolute catastrophe that for the taxpayer. We're not here to talk about that and uh, ask you specific questions about it. You're going to be able to answer those in lawsuits and with the regulators. But you are experienced and you were successful. And a couple of things we were asking is about going forward. Number one, uh, it is your opinion, as I understand it, that credit default swaps, credit default obligations should, in fact, be regulated by the federal government. Yes. Number two, should the sellers of credit default swaps be required to have a reserve against the loss? I believe you've indicated yes, and what would that be? I can't answer the second part yet without knowing uh, what... Well, we're $180 billion into the bailout, so when do you think you might have an answer for that? Well, uh, I think it depends on, on the bailout, and I'd like to come back to the bailout <laughs> Well, in a the bailout is the bailout. Yeah, it's but let me come back to that in a minute. In Horizon. Um, because the question is, should that, should that have been the way to bail out? No, I, we're not, I'm not asking you that. There is a question that the regulators are going to have to ask an answer. And if, if they agree with you, or we agree with you, that there should be regulation to credit default swaps, one of the questions is, what's a reserve that should be required? Well, if you put, I can't answer how much reserves yet, because there's a lot of other factors that have to go in. But if you, if you reserve yourself out of business, you're not going to have any credit default swap business, obviously. Well, you've dealt with reserves in insurance, obviously, and done it quite successfully. Yeah. So you have some profile of reserves. Yes, but we didn't do that by just sitting and talking this way. We had, re we had actuarial studies, we had a long history, and you'd have to make that kind of study. So absent actuarial studies, and given recent experience, on the basis of what you know, what you have seen happen, what reserve would you recommend be required in order, if your objective is to protect taxpayers and innocent shareholders, do I, I the think job? I think you have to have different reserves for different, for different uh, uh, companies that have different ratings, number one. I, I think that that would play a role in it. 
I think you'd have to tell me if, if I don't, I don't have a lot of time. I, I understand you can't answer that question. Let me ask you this. There was an immense explosion in leverage, borrowing in order to buy assets. Do well, you there believe, was. Do you believe that the Federal Government, as a result of this catastrophe, has to start regulating the amount of leverage that financial companies can use and put at risk not only shareholder value but taxpayer dollars? Yes, I think the leverage did get out of hand. I think, uh, for example, I think that um, investment banks um, were leveraging the capital 30 and 40 times what their capital was. I think that got out of hand. But that was approved by the SEC, is my understanding. Well, there's a lot of blame to go around. And the question I asked, I think you've answered. We have to put a limit on leverage. Yes. All right. The next question. If a company is too big to fail, and that's the argument that has been presented by the Fed Treasury, uh, the, the Treasury Secretary and the, uh, the Chairman of the Federal Reserve to justify uh, this extraordinary action of taxpayer intervention, if a company is too big uh, to fail, is it too big to exist? Well, I don't quite follow that. Why is it too big to exist? Well, the, the question is really pretty simple. Uh, AIG, uh, the fear of AIG failing was that a lot of innocent people would be collateral damage to the collapse. And the Federal Government did not want innocent people who knew nothing about uh, uh, CDOs or CDSs uh, to go down with the ship. Yeah, but it but depends on how you, uh, how you bail out. I mean, we went through this and, and um, I think if they had used guarantees and didn't use uh, cash, it would have been different. You could have renegotiated with the counterparties. There are many things that should have, that should have and could have been done and wasn't. So to, 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 to make a statement that, that what was done was the only way, uh, I, ju I just have you know to what? disagree with that. I, I actually I don't get that part. It should not be the risk of the taxpayers uh, to know all the details of how a company is being run. A company should be run according to rules that limit the risk to the taxpayers. And obviously that wasn't the case here. Well, I understand that, but when it, but when the company went to the government for assistance, uh, I think the way the assistance was offered uh, simply, in my judgment, do you think it complicated is, the problem. Do you think it is a, a, a proclamation of collapse and defeat if a private company with a proud tradition that has made billions of dollars, uh, issued billions of dollars in dividends to its taxpayers, has to uh, to its shareholders, has to come hat in hand uh, to the United States taxpayer and ask for a bailout. I think it was terrible. Well, I, I would agree with that. Yeah, the gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Right. Thank you very much. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Washington, D.C., Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton. I uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for yielding, and I certainly thank you for holding this very important hearing as we try to get our arms around, our brains around uh, what happened at a uh, AIG. Now, most people perhaps haven't heard of CV Star and Company, but that's what attracted my my um, attention. It's the company you continue to run um, that has come under fire as a tax haven for top. AIG executives. I want to ask you about a court suit that you have since settled, Teachers Retirement System of Louisiana versus Greenberg, uh, against uh, AIG and CV Star and Company, uh, a suit that stemmed from the relationship that CV Star had with uh, AIG and various uh, executives. Uh, of whom I think you'd have to include yourself. It alleged that half of the two billion dollars that AIG paid CV Star uh, between the years 2000 and 2005 represented sham commissions for work that in some cases it was said uh, or alleged was done by AIG employees. So the this, this suit essentially questioned uh, why uh, executives were allowed to serve simultaneously as officers uh, of CV Star, which of course is a closely held insurance company. Um, 
CD Star also gave uh, the defendants who were named uh, bonuses on fees from AIG. Um, the suit was settled in September 8th, just short of trial as I understand it, when four of the defendants, uh, including you, settled for about $115 million. I'd like you to comment on uh, the role CV Star had in providing uh, AIG executives these commissions? Yeah, I'd be glad to do that. Uh, you have to go back to the beginning of the history of AIG. As I said earlier, um, CV Star and Company predated um, AIG by probably two decades. Um, and when we were assembling AIG, there were several insurance general agencies, a marine agency, an energy agency, an aviation agency that were too small to, at that point, put into a company that was going public. So we retained them in C.V. Star and Company, but continued to underwrite on behalf of AIG uh, business that they otherwise would not have gotten. The board of directors of AIG knew all about this, uh, and, the, and there, was an, uh, there was an investigation or an examination to determine each year whether the commissions were fair that were being paid by AIG. Who, who, who did that examination? Uh, the outside auditors. Who was that? Uh, uh, Price Waterhouse. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, there was nothing improper about it. Uh, it went on for I don't know how many years. Uh, uh, for as long as AIG from the very beginning was uh, in business. You didn't business. defend the lawsuit. You, you did I, believe the settlement was the correct thing to do? May I finish first? Uh, um, the, Certainly. Uh, the, um, if AIG didn't get that business from these agencies, they would have had to go out and get it someplace else. And our judgment was that they would have done worse, not better. Uh, it was settled because the ongoing litigation would be more costly than it was to settle. That's unfortunate, but that happens the way it is right now in our country. You can have litigation that will cost millions and millions of dollars. But then the settlement is going to be paid uh, by CV Star. Why, why is it that you, you should not be personally liable in, in putting up some of the money for the settlement, given the role you played here and the fact that the settlement was done in the first place? Well, I don't think we did anything improper, but we settled. Well, the company, somebody had to pay it. And that's going to come out of the company you own, uh, who are going to contribute uh, between 20 and $30 million, as we understand, to the settlement. Yeah. But you're not personally contributing anything to this settlement. Most of it came from directors and officers of liability insurance. Yeah. Well, so the insurers are, 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 which is to say, people who paid into the insurance company. The gentle, gentlewoman's no. time has expired. Uh, outside, what, like, what we would suggest outside is Outside D&O insurance paid for it uh, mostly because it would have been in their interest to settle because go on and on and on, the cost would be greater and greater. Yeah. What, what I would like to suggest is that we do another round. Uh, but before we do that, I would like to recognize the Montclair Kimley Academy who uh, are in the room and it's indicated to, uh, to me at lunch that they're going to make certain that whatever's wrong, they're going to fix it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait. Glad to have them here. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I might suggest that we, uh, we yield to them. They, they probably could fix it quicker than we have, too. <laughs> they've, they've got more at stake. Kellen. Kellen. Yeah, second round. I'm sorry. I have to yield to the ranking member. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. But take, why don't you take the chair? Okay. You know, the, the questions get harder when they come up here. <laughs> Let me correct something. I understand that uh, Mr. Clay is here, and, and of course he has not done his first round. So before we go to the second round, I think it's only fair that we have Mr. Clay to do the first round. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, welcome, Mr. Greenberg, and, uh, and to your council also. Um, I want to talk a little about um, 
your tenure as chairman uh, and CEO at AIG, uh, um, times were mostly good. And you indicate in your written testimony that AIG was a great place to work and that employees adhered to a performance-based compensation system. Uh, I see no problem with that. Uh, employees should be treated well and rewarded for their successes. Uh, I am a bit concerned, however, that the culture of compensation at AIG was allowed to run amok. Uh, during your tenure, the company threw lavish conferences, retreats, and parties at a level that my constituents have never seen. Uh, that's fine when the company was doing well, but as you know, the American taxpayer now owns an estimated 80 percent of the company, and the landscape should be far different. Uh, that is why I was appalled to learn that after the federal bailout, AIG and its subsidiaries were still holding these events. The folks were getting their pedicures and manicures and uh, their facials all on the taxpayer's dime. Uh, were you equally disturbed to learn this? I was. And, the, uh, and that culture began on your watch. Uh, there is a difference between rewarding people for excellent performance and fostering a culture of extravagance uh, that people come to expect even after their company has failed miserably. Now, why, don't, why do you think it, it never changed? Was it just out of habit or? No, I don't know if it was habit. I think that um, you have to break that down. In the life insurance industry, uh, you have agency meetings. These are meetings where you have agents who have been successful in, in uh, developing a certain amount of life insurance uh, for the company. They have prizes, they have awards, and generally they, they, uh, they gather at some resort uh, as both a reward but also as a, as a, uh, a kind of a rah-rah a to have them um, produce more going forward. Um, that's historic in the life insurance business uh, and has been. Uh, but obviously, uh, when a company is essentially owned by the government uh, and using taxpayer money, uh, there has to be more restraints put on. People understand that. Uh, that's, not, uh, that's not a difficult thing to communicate. And uh, uh, if that needed to be done, it should have been done. Okay. Um, the, um, you, you indicate in your written testimony that uh, AIG is not too big to be managed. It is too big to be managed poorly. Uh, you go on to recommend that a new board and management team be installed. Further, during a March 3rd interview with CNBC, you expressed that Mr. Liddy is simply not qualified to run a global company like AIG. And, a, and in a March 20th AP interview, you said, I think we sh he should be replaced. Uh, you can call it what you want, just so that we are absolutely clear. Are you calling on him to resign? Look, what I've said, uh, and I think the record is, uh, speaks for itself, AIG is a global company, operates in 130 countries. There is no company like it in the world. Mm -hmm. You have to understand the culture of different countries. Uh, you have to understand how business is done in these countries. It is not, a, it's not an on-the-job training program. You've got to communicate to people uh, who understand how things are being done in different countries. And if, if the leader doesn't understand, it causes not only confusion, but sometimes chaos. Liddy is a nice person. I have nothing against Liddy as an individual. Uh, he ran a domestic insurance company, and he's, he's a good man. I have no problem with that. But he doesn't have the background for the job that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but he also came in with the mission of liquidating AIG. Now, how do you think that goes, uh, uh, that gets interpreted around the world where AIG does business when the, when the new leader comes to the company 
with the, with the uh, instructions to liquidate the company. He's not the most popular guy on, in, in town. And in any event, it's very difficult to manage something uh, to go forward growing it if you're there to liquidate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Mr. Greenberg, uh, again. Uh, do you know Robert Mundell, the uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, economist? Do you happen to know him? No, I don't think so. He, he had written uh, uh, What Caused the Crisis and the Way Out, and he listed uh, five causes of the crisis and, and uh, named you saying uh, Maurice Greenberg, AIG uh, founder, for conducting vast business in credit default swaps and mass multiples of derivatives. What would you say to Mr. Mundell? I think he's wrong. <laughs> what, uh, let me go somewhere else here. Um, have you hired any former AIG employees? You coaxed it, and have you coaxed any way? And I haven't coaxed them. I can't beat them off fast enough. They're they, they, they're calling and they come. We, we've hired some, yes. Do you know, have any sense of how many you've hired? Not many. Have you enticed others to leave AIG to come work for you? No, of course not. Paid anybody any sort of bonuses or, or in, uh, recruitment bonus, that sort of thing? No. They come to AIG, they, if they come to work for us, they come probably at, at, at possibly even less money than they're making now. But are they... Your primary goal is the success of AIG, correct? Why would you entice them away? I'm not enticing them away. Those are your words, not mine. So if you want the success of AIG, why would you want them to leave that company and come work for you? If they don't come to us, they're going someplace else. So you think they would leave? They would there's, a, there's an exodus of people from AIG. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out Congressman, that if you're going to liquidate a company and they're being offered jobs with other insurance companies, uh, and many are as we speak worldwide. I just came back from Asia. Um, AIG had a great position in China, as an example, uh, which it took me years and years to open that market. And we were the only company, AIG, to have 100% ownership. We were very proud of that fact and had a great growing business. Look at it now. People are leaving and going to every other company. Uh, why? AIG has said they're going to be selling the AIA, American International Assurance Company, a life company. But why would the people stay there? Let, let me move to another area. My time is short. Um, as we understand it, in 2003, the SEC and the Department of Justice were investigating IAG for basically helping two companies, PNC Financial and Bridge, uh, uh, Brightpoint, pardon me. Uh, and the reason they were investigating is that there was the questions about the, their bookkeeping and whatnot. Are these two investigations that led AIG's board to call for your resignation, or were these just the tip of the iceberg? Well, I wouldn't say either one of them is correct. Um, that's like saying, when did you stop beating your mother? Uh, uh, that's not, a, you know, that's not correct. The um, bright point was a tiny little uh, transaction that was done the bowels of the, uh, of the domestic insurance companies. The individual underwriter was a junior underwriter. He thought what he was doing was issuing a kind of a pension a type of product. Uh, it was, it turned out to be improper. Uh, I think AIG paid a $10 million fine for that. Um, uh, we had engaged Sullivan and Cromwell to do all the investigative work on it. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, they had failed, uh, my recollection is, with Sullivan and Cromwell to turn up all of the uh, advertising material that, uh, that had been developed. Uh, but it was not a, it was a minor transaction. Um, uh, my understanding is it cost the AIG in excess, my understanding is it cost AIG in excess of $120 million. No, that was in PNC. That was not Brightpoint. Not Brightpoint. That's cor incorrect. Now, a PNC, there was a separate board for AIG financial products. People such as Martin Feldstein uh, was and is on that board. Um, uh, there was a transaction with PNC. Uh, 
that my recollection uh, that AIG Financial Products got clearance uh, from an outside accounting firm and law firm and said that the transaction was proper from, from AIG Financial Products' point of view, and they told the counterparty, PNC, you've got to get your own opinions as to whether or not this is proper or not. Now, my, my understanding is uh, part of this, uh, what happened is they hired a, a Mr. Cole, an independent monitor, as required in the settlement. Um, what actions did you take to reform the corporate culture? Oh, pardon me, I didn't see the, the warning light. Yeah, okay. You may respond to this question. What actions did you take to reform the corporate culture at AIG after, in addition to the hiring of uh, Mr. Cole that happened? When Mr. Cole arrived, I was leaving the company. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this guy is I've been struck today mostly by, you know, the interest in this committee to get a picture um, of what it is that we need to do uh, to make sure this doesn't happen again. And obviously, uh, to get a feeling from you as to what happened that led us into this debacle. Um, and I mean, I think that there are people who are anxious to learn from our mistakes. And I think that uh, there's certainly plenty of blame to go around. Um, one thing that I think um, uh, is maybe one of the many causes of this is, uh, and that I will hold myself accountable for, is the voting for Gla the Glass-Steagall reform. And uh, I, for one, am going to introduce legislation to repeal that repeal, because I don't believe uh, we ought to be having, as it's been played itself out, AIG insurance companies doing banking business and uh, in banking businesses doing insuring uh, business and, and having apples over here and oranges over here and everybody's getting these financial um, products all mixed and matched. You've got derivatives and debt swaps and what are these things going happening? You've got people taking loans out and then taking insurance out on the loans because of another part of the company. I mean, it just seems we're rife with conflicts of interest. So what I'd like to hear from you is what was your perspective when that bill was going on through the Congress years ago, and did you support it? And uh, why did you support it? And would you still support it today? And would you support its repeal? Uh, first, I, I, I was fairly neutral. We had no intention. Now, can I just stop there? I mean, we, we can't get to this feeling of everybody's neutral here. We got to get answers. Well, I'm about to answer, if, if you permit me. <laughs> uh, we were neutral because we had never had any intention of buying a major bank. It was never our intention as part of our strategy to buy a major bank. Well, what's your perspective? Should we repeal it? Well, given the experience that has, uh, you know, that's occurred. But you know, if you look at if you look at what uh, has happened, take Citigroup for example, that. Uh, that I think was the moving party on that, and they wanted to buy Travelers. Well, Travelers has not been a problem company, and certainly, and certainly, um, Citigroup didn't get in trouble because of Travelers. But do, but do you not see the the inherent issues regulatorily that the federal government, when it's trying to micromanage, we're trying to put together bills now in, uh, in Congress to come in and do regulatory reform rather than try to micromanage a business that's very complex, why not go back to making sure that banks that just do savings and loans do savings and loans? Investment banks that do investment banking do investment banking, and insurance companies that do insurance do insurance. What's well, such a big problem with that? I'm not saying there's a problem, but you know, things don't stand still. Uh, things evolve, they grow, they change. And it seems to me if you have a 
if you have a structure that doesn't permit change at any time, that's just as bad as having too much uh, change at one time. You know, you can't change, I don't know, you can fix the structure uh, by regulation. It's management that goes bad, not many times not regulation. Um, and so I think if you're going to make changes in the regulatory environment, uh, I wouldn't rush because generally when we rush, we do it the wrong way um, and, then we, and then we regret it. Uh, we are competing in a, in a global world and we've got to be sure that we're not going to tie our hands uh, before we've thought through what exactly we want to do. And uh, I, I think, for example, you've, you've taken Glass-Steagall and the, and the, uh, the moving party in that uh, didn't cause the problem um, because of travelers, the acquisition of travelers. Uh, there were other things that may have gone sour. Um, and I think that uh, I come back to that, that uh, uh, mark to market accounting was one of the issues. Um, and, I, and I think that you can go back and you can say that leverage was another issue. Low interest rates may have been another issue. Uh, the abandonment of good, credit, of good risk management was another issue. And there are many issues to be considered. It wasn't just Glass-Steagall. Gentlemen's time has expired and we are going to a second round. Uh, that's a, everyone is very eager to, to uh, learn more from you, Mr. Greenberg. And uh, the chair recognizes herself uh, for five minutes. Uh, uh, your testimony that AIG would have been better off if going into Chapter 11. At this point, uh, taxpayers have put $180 billion into AIG. And you're telling me AIG would have been better off. My question is, would the taxpayers have been better off if AIG had gone to Chapter 11? The taxpayers would have their $180 billion that would be part of our Treasury, but what would have happened to our economy, in your judgment, if AIG had gone to Chapter 11? Well, if AIG went to Chapter 11 uh, at the very beginning uh, and, didn't, and didn't have access to the 85 billion dollars uh, at those uh, generous terms of 14 percent interest and 79.9 percent of the company. Um, what would have happened? Uh, there, would have been, there would have been a bankruptcy, uh, but a, a, a bankruptcy court uh, would have uh, taken hold of it. Uh, the counterparties would have been general creditors. It would not have affected the insurance subsidiaries. Uh, they're insulated. Uh, from that bankruptcy. State, state uh, laws uh, protect them and they were adequately capitalized. So it wouldn't have affected the insurance subsidiaries. It would have affected AIG financial products and, uh, and any, and, uh, but that's about the major issue uh, that would have occurred. But so. the impact on the overall economy, we're told that if AIG had failed, the whole con economy would have come down. Uh, there was a report that AIG prepared for Treasury that uh, made it sound like the world was going to come to the end uh, if AIG had gone into Chapter 11. Uh, I have asked uh, uh, several times for the Treasury's analysis of why it was critical for the financial stability of our country to save AIG. I am waiting for that to come forward. But my main point is what would have happened to the overall economy? And you are basically saying nothing would have happened to the American economy. The critical insurance arm, which is so critical, for finance in our country would have been independent and saved and the risky products over in London, who got the majority of the bonuses, by the way, and caused all the problem, uh, it would have, they would have lost their jobs. It would not have tumbled the markets. It would not have brought down uh, the housing market. It would not have brought down insurance. It would basically, are you saying, it would not have impacted in any major way the American economy? Is, am I correct in what you're saying? Well, I think there would have been a ripple, but it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been, uh, uh, it wouldn't have been catastrophic. The insurance companies would have continued doing business. They're protected. They were adequately capitalized, uh, and that capital couldn't be moved around. Uh, would it be some business leave AIG and go to another company? Possibly. Uh, competitors would have, uh, would have fed on the fact that AIG parent um, uh, became bankrupt and they, so competitors would have tried to move some business. But I don't think it would have been a, 
disastrous any more than it is right now. The government has nationalized essentially AIG. It's, it's owned 80 percent roughly by the government. Uh, that hasn't caused a, 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 rev you know, a revolution, earthquake, except that business is leaving the company as we sit here and speak. And we have $180 billion of taxpayer money uh, at risk or lost or whatever. And now they are asking, I am told, for an additional $30 billion money. Look, so should I we just stop right now and put them into receivership? What should we do now? I wish you had been in that room. Maybe we would have uh, averted a financial uh, uh, problem and a $180 billion and growing uh, 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 tax liability or, or, or debt on the American taxpayers. Um, what should we do going forward? Should we give them another $30 billion or put them in Chapter 11 now? What should well, we do? Well, I thought that's the reason I came down here uh, was to make some suggestions. And I, I did submit a paper. It does tell you at least what my opinion is as to how to save AIG and pay back the taxpayer. Uh, it does require using more guarantees than cash. It does require that you have to go to some of the counterparties and get some back. It does require uh, changing from 79.9 percent to something less and raising private equity by doing that, private capital. There are many things in the plan. And uh, mm -hmm. that's, what, that's the reason I came down to discuss, was there's an alternative to doing what's currently being done. I don't, ag I don't agree with the plan that, that the government has proposed. I think the plan is, is causing the taxpayer enormous pain. And, our, uh, and, and what we're trying to do is at least trying hard to find a way to find a better way to, and a better solution. Former Fed Chair Volcker uh, has testified that he please, believes going forward we should have functional regulation. Insurance should just be insurance. Commercial banking should be just commercial banking. We should not be mixing risky financial products with basic uh, services, that firewalls do not work. Uh, what is your opinion of that statement? Well, you know, I have great respect for Paul Volcker. He's a, mm -hmm. uh, he's a, he's a terrific, he's a terrific person. And, uh, mm -hmm. and a, a lot of what he says makes a lot of sense. But I have learned from experience when something goes wrong and we jump to, to a conclusion as to what we want to do to fix it, we generally overdo it the wrong way. So we want to give them some thought and look, examine mm -hmm. all of the aspects of what kind of regulation we want. We, well, need, more reg we need a different regulatory system. Let's, let's agree on that, but let's also agree, let's think it through. Okay. But I, to be clear, he also calls for a long deliberative process, but for, for certain key things being key. My time has expired. It's been fascinating to, to learn from you. And the Chair recognizes the ranking member. Mr. Issa from the Thank great you, state of Chair. California. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Greenberg, this, is, this has been helpful today and I appreciate your time. Uh, let me just try to wind up a lot of the questions we have been asking here. First of all, you have never been privy to any conversations at Treasury or at the Federal Reserve. Is that true? Uh, as to AIG bailout? No. That's correct. They haven't called you for advice or uh, uh, even acknowledged that they are listening to you. Is that correct? I've had several talks with Tom Baxter at the New York Fed um, and had uh, two talks with uh, uh, Tom Geithner, um, one when he was Secretary of the Treasury and one when he was with the New York uh, Tim, Fed. Tim Geithner. Tim, Tim Geithner. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, the, uh, well, I am glad to hear that they, they have included you some. Uh, the decision of whether or not to take Federal money or to file bankruptcy, that's a, that's a decision that the Chief Executive Officer and the Board made. Is that correct? Nobody yeah. can stop you from filing bankruptcy. No, I would assume that's, that was their decision. So would you say that, uh, that there was a lack of a fiduciary responsibility on the part of the Board in that uh, rather than protecting many of the operations, they entered into these uh, huge taking of money at a 14 percent rate, uh, mostly preferred uh, stock and, and other instruments? I don't know what they knew at the time, uh, Congressman. I just don't know what they knew at the time. But from, but from a distance, it seemed to me that uh, I don't know whether they would have done it today, given what they know now and the amount of yeah. funds that they have had to take. 
Well, Mr. Greenberg, I voted against the TARP, and I, uh, I felt that, uh, as you did, or as you say here today, that uh, guarantees where appropriate should be used, bankruptcy where appropriate should be used, and, and I am finding myself agreeing with you that AIG should have been put into bankruptcy, guarantees where appropriate should have been put in, uh, but that is too late now. I have got a couple more questions, though, that I think because of your 35 years of building a company and your knowledge of these, uh, what is existing in the way of regulation, what might be necessary, let me just ask you a question. I have got a bill, H.R. 74. It calls for a commission similar to the 9-11 commission after, obviously, 9-11, that calls for a, a, a bipartisanly appointed blue ribbon panel to look into the causes of and any additional regulations for. Do you think that is a better solution than Congress having bill after bill, uh, sometimes just taking back people's bonuses? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, I guess the, uh, the last question, uh, oh, and Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent my closing statement be put into the record at this time. Without objection. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, the last question is, we have gone this far, we have gone $700 billion into this process. Would we be better off evaluating the worth of various banks and using assurances, not with AIG, but with the entire financial community, using government assurances to, if you will, guarantee as what we see the, the value of the going concern, rather than uh, giving out money and thus displacing other private sector money. Well, you've done that uh, with uh, Citigroup. You've guaranteed three hundred billion dollars of uh, of assets, and uh, that's a pretty good. That's a pretty. But we've good done it with some of it. Of course, part of it was they ran out of the seven hundred billion. So they, <laughs> when they ran out of money, they began doing the right thing. What well, some might say. Maybe it would have been better to run off quickly so you can get some more guarantees out. I think guarantees are a good way to go. And. Uh, Lastly, I just want to follow up on uh, what Mrs. Maloney said because I think it's critical. Had AIG filed bankruptcy, a substantial, and correct me if I'm wrong, a substantial portion of the money that was delivered to AIG, which then went to foreign banks, would have not gone. If they had simply said, file bankruptcy and there's a default, and to the extent that somebody wants to make you whole, great, but otherwise you lose. We would have preserved forty billion or so dollars of U.S. They Treasury money. They would have become money. a general creditor. And so, uh, at the end of the day, um, if, if AIG, how if it was wound up, uh, would uh, would have made whatever twenty cents on the dollar, an agreement of thirty cents on the dollar, there'd be some negotiation and some settlement. So, Mr. Chairman, if I could just sort of close this question because I think it's 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 critical to what you've given us here today. Had the Federal Government allowed AIG to go bankrupt, tens or hundreds of billions of dollars would have been preserved of Federal Treasury money by simply allowing foreign banks to accept the risk which they made when they allowed a private entity to insure on their behalf with a public statement that they were able to evaluate. That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, again, thank you for uh, giving me the extra time. Right. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, that was uh, a good question. You know, I uh, actually um, I yield to Mr. Cummings of Maryland. Again, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for this hearing. It has been quite informative. Um, Mr. Greenberg, thank you for your testimony. And I, I just, you know, I am sitting here and I am trying to, I am listening to you. And I am um, thinking about my constituents. I got constituents as old as you are. And I'm not saying you're old, but you're a, you know. And thank you very much. <laughs> and you know what? They retired, but they got to go back to work. Working in McDonald's, flipping hamburgers. You know why? Because when they look at their investment portfolios. They've disappeared. And can I tell you something? They ain't coming back. That money is not coming back. And then I read here in Pro ProPublica the, a piece by Sharona Coots. It's April 1st. You're not familiar with this, I'm sure. But you know what it says here? It says AIG launched 
a preemptive, and I want to be fair to you, strike Wednesday, putting out a four-page dossier attacking Greenberg's credibility. Quote, given that Hank Greenberg led AIG into the credit default swap business, has repeatedly refused to testify under oath about a transaction he initiated when he was still AIG CEO and is being investigated by the SEC and the Justice Department, we don't understand how he can be viewed as having any credibility on any issue, end of quote. Now, the reason why I raise that is not to attack you, but to understand there's some forces going on here that apparently AIG, I get the impression that the folks at AIG now and you, you don't have no, there ain't too much love going on there. That's, I say, good, that's good that, That's an accurate statement. But the problem still remains, no matter what's happening between you and them, my constituents are still suffering. And they, and so I want to just ask you this. I want to pick up where I left off and ask again about the $80 billion in toxic credit default swaps that ultimately, whether directly or through collateral calls, led to AIG's demise. The public wants to know, those, those people that I talked about that are going back to work, in an article that appeared in the Washington Post on December 30th, you are credited with saying that $7 billion of those swaps were issued during your tenure. But AIG spokesman Mark Herr refutes that claim, saying it was $40 billion. When I asked you this question earlier, you said you didn't know. Is that your testimony today, that, that you don't know how many of those swaps were issued uh, during your tenure? And can you please uh, tell us what the deal is? Very simple. Um, AIG has not made available the information. I don't carry that knowledge around in my head, uh, Congressman. Uh, they have not made the information available. They haven't reported it. Uh, it's not in any of the 10K uh, filings. Well, if you get it, will you submit it to us? We've asked for the information. Well, and if you get it, will you su submit it to us? I'd be glad to. I so also want to get some clarification on the part of your written testimony where you talk about whether swaps issued while you were CEO were hedged. Specifically, you state uh, that the financial products was subject to numerous risk controls by AIG senior management and conducted this business largely on a hedged basis. Yet AIG spokesman Mark Herr says these swaps were written without hedges. What's, what, what, what's the deal? The, as I said earlier, uh, you may not have been in the room, uh, the original swaps were for the European banks. Um, they were not hedged and, they, and there were no losses uh, that ever were reported on that, on that uh, um, amount of business. Um, uh, we, AIG was a AAA rated company and, um, and, and as such, uh, hedging at that point for what we were writing uh, was not was not necessary. Uh, we hedged other parts of the of the business where we thought it was necessary. Um, the risk management department, which was very extensive in AIG, um, uh, would make recommendations. But it, it was a well-run organization. I got it that. Changed when Let me I ask left. It changed. One of your recommendations is that we get money back from the counterparties. Is that right? Say that again. You said that we should be getting money back from the counterparties. Is that what you said? What I'm saying to you is you have to look at the whole program of, uh, of, uh, of what changed. Do you, do you think we should have dis there should have been some discount with regard to those counterparty Absol debts? Absolutely. Not only discount, I think in some cases um, I I'd have used guarantees. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. And let me um, make do my second round. I have not had mine. So, um, Mr. Greenberg, um, as you're aware, uh, Joseph Cassano took over as chief of AIGFP AIG in 2001, and of course you were there. Essentially, he was known amongst some of your friends as your favorite because of his drive, according to a recent report that Mr. Cassano basically told senior management, you know insurance. I know investment, so you do what you do, and I'll do what I do. Leave me alone. Of course, uh, I understand he was stronger language than that. Uh, is that true? No. <laughs> was Mr. Cassano essentially given a free hand within the company to set up AIGFP across the pond in London? Not a free hand. Uh, doing business in London 
uh, was very convenient because you're halfway on, f on the phone conversation between the, between the United States and Asia. And it was a very, that's why a lot of firms set up offices in London. Uh, it was a, it's the best place to do uh, a financial service business if you're doing business in Asia and the United States. Was it true that no one could control Mr. Cassano? No, that's not true at all. Well, when I did know, this, I don't know when did happened. he go astray? Look, I can't answer what happened after I left. I had no problem controlling Cassano. <laughs> when did this happen? I mean, you know, I understand you've been out now, what, four years? Four years. But it's hard for me to believe that some of this didn't happen before you left. Well, I'm, I'm sorry if you can't believe it, but I'm telling you, <laughs> we had no problem controlling Cassano. Right. You know, and I know in, indicated early on that you talked about in terms of um, uh, possible bankruptcy, uh, which I was, I must admit, I was shocked. Let me ask you, what should the Treasury do now? What should we do? Look, and I, you indicated you came to help us. I, I, I submitted a plan. Uh, it's in my paper. I'll be glad to, I'll be glad to repeat it if you'd like. Uh, uh, I, I think that uh, you have to use more guarantees. You've got to reduce the 79.9% the so you can get raised private capital. Um, you know, I think that, you know, I would hope that your plan would have uh, time frames on it. For instance, what should Treasury do in the next 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, six months? You know, that's the kind of help we need. Well, somebody's got to take hold of it and do it. That's not my job. That's somebody else's job. I've given you an outline of what I think will work. Um, um, I can't, uh, I, I'm not here to execute it for you. Right. No, I mean, the point is that uh, we need to have, if you give it, you want to help us, I think time frames is also a part of, of that help that we need. Well, you know. uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I'd love to see it done. I'd be glad to work with anybody uh, that's authorized to do this. I've offered to help several times. I've offered to, uh, I've offered, uh, when I spoke to uh, Tom Bax at the New York Fed to help, I've offered two CEOs of AIG to help, uh, William Stott and, um, uh, and um, uh, Liddy. I've offered twice now to help. I'm, I'm not going to force myself on them. Well, let me ask this question. You know, um, was there any other unit besides uh, AIG's FP that led to... Uh, uh, the downfall. Say that again. Is there any other? I think the question is: uh, Is any other unit contribute to the AIG failure besides AIG FP? I think the security lending program uh, uh, caused the problem. Um, it was manageable if that was all there was, um, but um, they got too exuberant in um, in what they were doing. Right. Mr. Grimm, you understand what we're trying to do here. We're trying to get as much information as possible to be able to look and to see and to make certain that this kind of situation doesn't exist, doesn't come about again. That's the, the reason we want to talk to you. That's the reason why we want you to be forthcoming to us to, to try and assist us. You know, we're not sure what happened here. Was it the regulators that went to sleep? Were they Rip Van Winkle? I don't know. I mean, what happened here? Something happened. You have to admit, acknowledge that. Mr. Chairman, I don't think it was the regulators who fell asleep. Um, whether they did or not, I don't know. But I do know that management fell asleep after I left the company. There's no question about it that management took their eye off the ball um, and risk management was not getting the right instructions. And that's what led to the downfall. Right. Thank you. I see my time has expired. Right. Congressman Foster, for, recognized for five minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions on, on your securities lending business, which I take it were, was responsible for a significant fraction of the, the difficulties. And um, first off, who owned the securities that were being loaned? Which business? Probably the life companies. The life companies. Okay. And so now, 
And now, who was actually performing the loaning and making the decisions about? I think that was done by Winnuga, the head of investments. Okay, so this was done individually for each one of the the life business units. I think units? he was, he, you know, he was the overall head of investments, and who was carrying out that day to day on his instructions. I can't tell you, I'm not there. Okay, I'm trying to understand if these were sort of tunneling through the ring fence um, that was supposedly around. Normally, what happens in security lending, an insurance company, a life company, has huge amount of assets that's been invested. They have these securities. A lot of banks and investment banks want to borrow them, yep. say for 30 days, and they give you uh, cash. Yep, um, certainly. And you, you normally invest the cash in short-term receivables that will earn you three to five or six basis points. Uh, somebody got exuberant and were investing in uh, for 30 basis points, as I understand it, and a lot of it had toxic uh, subprime assets involved, and so when the banks wanted back their cash, right. AIG couldn't sell the securities at that amount to cover that. And the Fed so, no, set up... Could you explain why this wasn't picked up by the individual insurance regulators? I don't know. I wasn't there. So, so this, this you would view as a failure of the individual insurance regulator, the fact that this was allowed I would to say that's probably right, unless the amount involved was not um, considered by the regulator to be of such amount as to impair the solvency of the company. Okay, are there are there regulations that you think are, are new forms of or better enforcement of existing regulations well, that, that should could prevent this sort of thing in the future? I, I think before you get to that, though, uh, in all fairness, a life company invests um, to cover its liability, and it gets an asset to match match mm -hmm. that. So if you got a guarantee of say 3% and you're invested 4.5%, you really don't care during the inter 10 or 15 years whether that security sells at a discount as long as it's paying its interest or dividend, sure. yeah. cash flow approach to it. Changing mark to market destroyed all of that. And, it and the life insurance industry today in our country is suffering as a result of that. That affected somewhat the security lending program. Okay. Now, the other, I, I'd like to touch on the issue of the complexity as well as the size of organizations. Um, from the point of view of the regulator, um, if, would you consider that a regulator for the AIG holding company would have to be an expert on each of the business units, they'd have to be an expert on airplane leasing, credit default swaps, securities lending, property and casualty, life insurance, and so on and so forth? I mean, is there, is there, uh, is there a regulator you know that is actually expert in those areas? It probably, probably working for me. <laughs> right, well, but it's a serious thing because no. we're faced all the time uh, with the, the problems that the, regulators uh, are outgunned, salary-wise, manpower-wise, and intellectually. Yeah, well, that, that's frankly. true. Right. right. Well, this is a, a fundamental problem. The answer to that is to simply say, um, you know, what would have been the evolution of AIG if you'd been allowed to play in only one sandbox? that you essentially said, okay, you can be an insurance company, you can be a big successful insurance company, but when you get successful, return your dividends to your shareholders and they will invest in some diversified enterprise. Well, that would have limited them, but the market would have eventually um, distributed assets to all of the, you know, all the relevant industries. And without having, putting one regulator in a position where they have to be experts on all this stuff. Well, that's one way. I'm not sure that's the best way. But what would, what would you suggest to, to not have to depend on a regulator you know, being you have, you have as very smart good, as you are? You had very good state regulation on the insurance side, which was the biggest side part of AIG's business. Mm -hmm. The airline leasing company is not regulated per se, uh, besides which AIG did not guarantee the debt of, uh, of uh, its uh, airline leasing company. So it, that did not cause a problem from that point of view. Uh, the, um, the the question of uh, AIG FP was regulated so, by the. So you believe that the holding company needs no regulator because all the individual pieces. Work. No, I you know I think you can have a regulator. It could be it could be the FDIC or it could be I don't care which right. one it is. And, and would that regulator need to be an expert on each? No, of No, he would call on the regulators that had the uh, that okay. had the other areas, which is done in I think many other countries. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. I now yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from California, Diane Watson.
gentleman from California. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank uh, Mr. Greenberg and uh, the Council for being so patient with our questioning. So, uh, directed to Mr. Greenberg, uh, at least five of the credit risk committee members who were in part responsible for failing to properly assess the dangers of heavily investing in credit default swaps remain in place at AIG. This means that at least 50 percent of the individuals at the top, the same people that performed shoddy risk assessments, are still at the helm. And those same five were there when you were CEO. So uh, during your tenure, did any members of the Credit Risk Committee ever perform a risk assessment of uh, AIG FP? And specifically, were there limits on the amount and type of risk that the AIG FP were allowed to undertake, and how did it change after you left AIG? Can you comment, please? There were limits. First of all, the, the, uh, the credit committee or the enterprise committee, because it had both market risk and credit risk, met on a regular basis with very senior people responsible for the various areas that the credit committee and the market risk and credit risk committee covered. They would meet regularly to make sure that each one of them knew what the total exposure was, for example, say to real estate. Um, and uh, and uh, that, um, that number, they would stress test, uh, they would determine whether or not uh, we were getting overloaded in a particular area. If any of the operating divisions were resisting uh, changing, um, there would be, it would go to the ch chief financial officer who would bring the head of the risk management uh, committee and the other, and the department that they were con concerned with into my office and we would resolve it right then. There was control and there was, uh, there was a, a recognition and a culture in the company that uh, risk management was important. It has to start from the top. If the, if the organization does not believe that the CEO is concerned with risk management, nobody else will. And that was you? That was me. Well, is the continued employment of the same five credit risk committee members who failed to see the writing on the wall concerning credit default swaps a good management decision? Well, the same people are there. It stuns me that they are. It stuns me that they're still there. Okay. Now, uh, Robert Lewis, who was the chief risk yeah. officer, has been with uh, AIG since 2004, one year before you left as uh, CEO. And AIG's auditor, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, expressed concern about Mr. Lewis's uh, unit in January of uh, 2008. And the Office of Thrift Supervision also informed AIG of the mismanagement of risk by Mr. Lewis's unit. And do you believe that Mr. Lewis has the necessary skill sets and expertise to continue to handle this you know, at AIG? He had those skill sets when I was there. It's hard for me to understand what happened. It's hard to understand. So I would like to, you know, I think before he's condemned, somebody ought to find out whether or not he was told not to enforce the rules that he believed needed to be enforced. You know, we're holding this hearing to try to get to the bottom of this. The failure of AIG has had a ripple effect, as you know, almost universally around the globe. And we're trying to gather information. We appreciate you coming and uh, the time you're taking to try to explain. But if you were there now as the current CEO, what steps would you take to improve uh, the Credit Risk Committee and its performance? Give us some help so we can advise. Well, there are several things. If, um, if I found out that um, 
and that Lewis either did not enforce the rules or was told not to enforce the rules, uh, I'd find out why and whoever was responsible for that uh, would have an exit interview very quickly. Um, and there's no question that uh, uh, if he in, took that on himself, uh, he'd be gone Nothing very else. quickly. Um, but in order to save AIG, you've got to do more than deal with, uh, yeah. with the risk management area. Um, I, I repeat what I said earlier. Um, I proposed a plan that I think ought to be considered uh, to help save the taxpayer um, a great deal of money. It will not, AIG will not be, in my judgment, uh, the current plan will not pay the taxpayer back. You have to rebuild AIG, rebuild it, uh, try and get as much as we can back from the counterparties, use guarantees as much as possible in order to uh, conserve uh, cash and then raise capital from the private sector after you reduce the 79.9 percent. Make J AIG a a taxpayer again and an employer, not destroying it. That, how is that going to pay anybody back right. and create jobs? Yeah. Well, thank gentlemen's you for time, I'm sorry, the gentlewoman has expired. Yeah. Gentlewoman's yeah. time has expired. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Mr. Chairman. Recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Greenberg. Um, it is my understanding that AIGFP, the entity that is apparently at the core of AIG's collapse, had its own board of directors that was separate from the parent company's board. My question is, um, does the fact that AIGFP has a separate board prevent or hamper the parent company from exercising proper oversight? No, because most of the, in fact, all of the members of the a AIG FP separate board came from the main board of AIG. They came from the main board. <laughs> yeah. In fact, the day we used to hold the AIG board meetings, late that afternoon, there'd be an AIG financial products board meeting, and several of the same members on the main board would attend. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, since April of 2004, AIGFP has had its own transaction review committee, which was comprised of Joseph Cassano, the CEO of AIGFP, and senior executives from the unit's business, legal, finance, and risk management groups. Amongst other responsibilities, this committee assesses AIGFP's compliance with regulatory and accounting standards in structured finance transactions. And Mr. Frank Zarb was the chairman of the executive committee of AIG's board of directors, but was also on the board of directors of AIGFP as of November 2004 while you were the CEO. Did Mr. Zarb ever raise any reservations concerning AIGFP's investments or derivative risk? Or did Mr. Zarb or anyone else, to your knowledge, raise the issue of the potential conflict of interest in having the same person serve on both the board of AIGFP and the parent company? No, that was never raised. And so it was never raised. It was never perceived. Then no, it was. Uh, it was never raised. That um, you know, we had Sullivan Cromwell at that point as outside counsel to the board. Um, in fact, one of Sullivan Cromwell's um, uh, uh, people uh, who had been connected with AIG for many, many years and was a, had been a partner of Sullivan Cromwell was on the board of uh, financial products. Well, let me ask you one other question. Uh, of course, we just passed the Pay For Performance Act in the House yesterday. And essentially, this act will restrict compensation and bonuses for institutions that have received and not paid back 
funding from the top or the Housing and Economic Recovery Act. Could you comment on this bill and whether you consider it to be a step in the right direction in terms of properly regulating executive compensation? Well, I haven't read the, the bill, but um, you know, my own sense is that over any period of time, uh, it would be best to have not, the, not have the government setting compensation rules uh, for business. Now, I recognize when you take a great deal of money from the government, the government has to have a say uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the compensation of a company. But if, you, if the compensation is, is not competitive uh, with the marketplace generally, it doesn't help uh, to have people who will not perform at the level that you want that company to perform uh, because they're not being compensated adequately. Uh, now, having said that, uh, I would agree with anyone uh, that compensation in the financial sector got out of hand um, in our country. Well, let me just say and ask this. Under the concept of pay-for-performance, if assets are not being protected, if the public's resources are not being adequately protected, um, would you see any opportunity to enhance one's pay based upon their performance relative to the protection of those assets? No, if they haven't protected the assets, obviously they they should not be competent. They probably ought to be fired. Which means then that the bonuses that individuals have been awarded in some instances where it's clear that the assets were not protected, then those bonuses would not be warranted. They should not be, they should not get bonuses. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Greenberg. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Greenberg. You know, uh, we really um, uh, want to thank you for coming today and, uh, and sharing with us. However, um, you know, when we ask you a little bit about the plan, you know, uh, I felt that uh, uh, you uh, didn't realize how important it is for us because, uh, but the point is that I want you to know that your plan is important to us and we will look at it and we will uh, take uh, and share it with the other members of, of, of this committee and make certain that they look at it. And so let me just close uh, by saying um, I appreciate your being here and I appreciate the interest of all the members who attended this hearing today. And before we adjourn, let me state that this committee intends to continue its examination of the financial crisis until we get a much better understanding of what caused it. As the old saying goes, the past is prologue. Until we can explain what went wrong, how can we chart the best course for reform? Today's hearing was just the first in a series of hearings where we will explore the roots of the financial crisis that grips our country. While it appears to be a conglomeration of problems that brought us to this point of economic crisis, one thing is clear. The so-called magic of the marketplace created more misery than good. Market self-regulation, discipline, and efficiency can no longer be relied upon to serve the good of the American people. Appropriately, regulation is no longer a dirty word, and I look forward to working with the, this administration and my colleagues, uh, uh, my the ranking member, Mr. Issa, and members on the both sides of the aisle to fashion meaningful financial regulations to stem the tide of financial ruin now and in the future generations. Finally, uh, please let the record demonstrate my submission of a binder with documents relating to this hearing. Without objection, I enter the binder in the committee record. This concludes our hearing. The committee is now in, in recess for two minutes to prepare for the business meeting.
As this hearing on federal aid to AIG comes to a close here in the Rayburn House office building on Capitol Hill, we're going to stay in this building and move to another hearing room for live hearing on accounting and recovery of POW.